Can anybody tell me who these guys are? Uh, that's Dirac, that's Pauli, who's also uh, Austrian, and who's the other person on the extreme right? That's uh, Rudy Pyles. Oh. And you've heard the name Pyles almost for sure in many different contexts. He was a brilliant uh, theoretical physicist of the 20th century. And this picture was taken in 1952. We'll get back to why it's relevant. Okay. So lots of young people think DFP starts with Holmberg, Cohn, Cohn, Samson before in 65. That's not true. This paper by Thomas, well, he did in 1926. And he doesn't mention the Schrodinger equation because I don't think he'd heard of it because he was in Britain and uh, he sent it in in November. And he writes down a very crude Thomas Fermi theory. And that theory is remarkably accurate for such a simple theory. It gives you total energies within 10%. But a slight problem with it is that when you bring two atoms together, the energy does not go down. So molecules don't bind, which makes it very hard to get a job in a chemistry department. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it was Edward Teller who proved that. Now, what people don't necessarily realize is from about that time until the 50s, for at least 30 years, the standard way of doing a solid state calculation was using Thomas Fermi theory. And there's this very interesting paper by some names you recognize, Feynman, Metropolis, and Teller. And this paper comes out in FISREFB in 1949, but we're pretty sure the reason it comes out in 1949 is that it just got declassified. Uh, and if you look at the table, they actually do the calculations for average atom calculations and Thomas, they send the Thomas Fermi theory for a particular element, Z equals 92, which is what they had been doing the calculus. This was presumably what they used in the Manhattan Project, uh, but it wasn't declassified until later. Now, so this Thomas Fermi theory was good enough for that. Uh, even though it's too crude for our modern purposes. Uh, only this one I included for you. Uh, AFM images. This is a, uh, uh, one of these is the theory. Uh, this is the experimental data on top, I think, and the, uh, the theory matching quite well with the experimental data. Or it might be the other way around for uh, AFM uh, pictures of graphite. This paper, is uh, one of the first papers I published when I got to Santa Barbara with an experimental group, Paul Hansmith. And what's interesting about this paper is that, um, so I do have a background in surface science. That's what I used to do. And so this, I found this figure here, which I remembered we did, which it's, it's six simulated images of the graphite. And we compared those six to 12 experimental pictures, which was all the pictures in the world at that time uh, of graphite with an AFM tip that had just been uh, invented. And people used graphite to test their technology. And we could do, we could simulate every experimental uh, case with six pictures. So things, Things have uh, you know, evolved a bit since then. So that's my little bit about the past, but I'll sort of bring you up to date as we go along. Next. So also somewhat in the past, last 10 or 15 years, we've had AI has come along, right? And you're gonna hear lots of stuff about that. So my qualifications to talk about machine learning, uh, I think I just have to use this. I'm not an expert in machine learning, and I don't even like it, right? Uh, uh, hmm? I mean, at least you like it. Yes. Uh, but I was very lucky. I ran into a guru in this about 12 years ago, Klaus Robert Mueller. Uh, and then I've been using it in DFT applications ever since. since. Uh, and also, I created a course, the course I have to go back to teach on, on Thursday uh, uh, for sci uh, scientists. 
And I've had many graduate students doing ML and lots of physics undergraduates. Uh, this is only this is only eight years ago, right? When uh, DeepMind creates an algorithm, machine learning algorithm called AlphaGo, which beats one of the world Go masters. Uh, and after they do that, next year, Lee sadly uh, retired because the machine could beat him. Uh, but now he consults, I think, for various companies developing machine learning algorithms like DeepMind. Uh, and since then, of course, they've developed algorithms that can beat every human and have also developed with generative algorithms totally new strategies for Go that no human could ever keep up with. And they have a, an algorithm now that is both the world Go champion and the world chess champion, right? Can beat other things and play many, many games. Okay, chat GPT. Have we used chat GPT? Raise your hand if you've used chat GPT. Uh, there we go. No shame in it. Okay, so uh, about a year or so ago, I was just checking this out, right? You have to multiply two four digit numbers together and out pops this answer here. And of course, it turns out two of the digits in the middle are wrong, right? <laughs> and lots of us have made jokes about chat GPT, but there's nothing wrong with what it's doing here, right? It's not designed to tell you the truth. It's designed to give you text that you expect, right? That it's plausible, that's all. Now, I went back and when I was preparing this slide, I went back and checked this. Now it gives you the right answer. And how does it do it? It writes itself a little Python code to multiply your two numbers together, runs the code and reads the answer back to you. Uh, okay. Oh, the clothes washer. We were discussing laundry on the bus. Uh, me, me and Georg, you know, you see sort of the, you know, the old guys deep in conversation and think, oh, it must be something very deep. Yeah, it was our laundry. Uh, so a ten, a ten dollar heat center on a clothes uh, dryer uh, died, but it takes two hours to take the thing apart to get at it. Uh, so instead, we buy a new one, right? Uh, that's great. It has this wonderful little, it looks like it, you could watch movies on the dial of the thing, right? And this is just my bad photo, right? But this is the normal wash. But you can do towels, obviously, right? It's all electronic. You can do bedding. Great, great. But my favorite one is AI wash. You can now have your AI in your washing machine. So then I asked, you know, hey, I said, this is great. Uh, and I asked around the house, like, who else is using it? Everybody else is afraid to touch the button, right? <laughs> Me, I'm throwing in all sorts of random uh, things to try to uh, defeat the AI, but so far, so good. Okay, this week in nature, well, this is uh, a year ago, uh, we had this thing, but we, we would have this thing in my course where we just, every week in nature, they have some uh, machine learning stuff, right? This, this go, you may not be able to see it at the back. This is a fraction of papers in computer science using machine learning, and this is 25%, but it's probably hit 50% already this year. You know, it's just taking over. Uh, but there's a blue line here that's going up to about 8%, so obviously past 10% now. That's in physical sciences, the fraction of papers that have machine learning in them. So the virus has appeared in our field, right? Uh, and then you can ask questions about the quality of those papers. So a little warning. Uh, so more than 50% of the papers with machine learning should not have been published. And I gave this talk to AI for Science, Microsoft AI for Science, and I was a little nervous when I came to this slide and I said, you know, and they all laughed and they said, you think it's only 50%? I don't know. <laughs> uh, so, but that doesn't mean Right, so there is quite a lot of junk out there, and it could be hard to tell, right? But that doesn't mean there isn't good stuff coming as well, right? Uh, but you do have to watch out for it, and it's really stressing our scientific publishing uh, system. Okay, so my part in the downfall of humanity is finding density functionals, right? Uh, so that's what I care about, uh, as we heard about on Friday. Uh, and we did this thing years ago 
we took particles in a box, the simplest possible problem. And what we wanted to find was what's called the cone sham kinetic energy. So this is just the kinetic energy of fermions. And we just put them in a box. And we said, we'll use kernel ridge regression, which uh, was still popular at the time. And we make up a density functional and we write it in terms of a kernel that's a simple Gaussian kernel in the L2 norm of two density differences. But what's intriguing about this is this is a totally non-local functional of the density. It looks nothing like anything that any person has done before. And the reason we do this is we wanted to try to solve problems that no one had solved before, not to play around with functional approximations that people do, but to do something totally new, to see if it could do it. Uh, and uh, part of the application is if this is orbital free DFT, if you had that guy, you could, uh, you wouldn't have to solve your cone sham equations. And within a few weeks, uh, Matthias Ruff and John Snyder uh, were, got it running so that its error was less than one kilocal per mole, typically with about a hundred training data. And for this problem, local density approximation and grading correction are a few hundred kilocals per mole. No one's ever really gotten this to work before. We got it working for our little toy case. Uh, later, we wanted to do uh, better things. And so we did this uh, with Mark Tuckerman's group uh, at NYU. And uh, what we did was we take a molecule and we had to sort of evolve the methods quite a bit. Uh, the original ones uh, wouldn't work on something so complicated. Uh, so this is malinaldehyde. And we saw, so what it's doing is running an MD simulation with that kinetic energy functional instead of solving the cone sham equations. And we saw this case of a proton transferring from one side to the other, which wasn't in the training set. So we had trained on about 2,000 realizations of this molecule uh, at about 600 Kelvin, and then uh, it could do the do this MD simulation without uh, with the machine learned functional. I always like to mention now uh, this work. I've forgotten about it, and I remember giving it a hard time at the time. 1996. Somebody tried to get the exchange correlation, you know, the most important piece of the energy that we all want to know in DFT uh, using a neural network. This was in the previous generation of people trying to use neural networks. Then, not so long ago, uh, 21, I guess, or 2020, uh, this very good uh, Japanese group figured out how if you use the exact density in constructing your functional, uh, you can generalize much better. And sort of based on that, we sort of did a polished up version of that. We applied it to strongly correlated systems. And we sort of put, built in a few tricks. And this was me and one of my guys uh, with Google Accelerated Science. Every single person here has already left Google Accelerated Science in the three years since. The whole team has uh, gone off in other directions. But Lee Lee was my former student who led this. And what we were able to show was that the uh, you could get chemical accuracy, so about 1.6 millihartree accuracy with a binding energy curve of H2 just by training on two points, one stretched point and one uh, and a one point near equilibrium and a validation point. And the point of this is none of your standard DFT uh, calculations get this binding energy curve all the way out because it becomes a strongly correlated system out here. But by training on one example, just one example of a strongly correlated system, we get the whole curve. And we could get other combinations of, of hydrogen molecules working almost as well without training on them. And then uh, late in 21, so about two years ago, uh, two and a half years ago, uh, Google DeepMind, those folks who had done the uh, AlphaGo thing, uh, ended up um, <coughs> producing a functional. 
that looked very promising at the start. Anybody here try to run GM21? Because if you had, it probably hasn't converged yet. Right? <laughs> uh, so it turned out to be a bit of a bust because it was a bit over-engineered and getting it to converge uh, didn't really work out. Okay, present, fast. So I got stuck in San Francisco for 12 hours there uh, in April last year because I was on my way to Korea and suddenly they needed a visa and I didn't realize that. Uh, but I was then I just got the next plane. This young guy, Dosh, we call him, is there at Google Brain. Uh, and he, he used Google's resources to generate uh, millions of DFT calculations of alloys and found, you know, 10 times as many stable compounds compared to the 35,000 that were known before. And this increases the, so the materials genome project, uh, yeah, I think they have at least 10 times many more materials than the materials genome project had. So in one shot, they sort of uh, found uh, just way, way more materials than the federal government had after about a billion dollars of funding that have been put into this, right? Uh, and there's some controversy about some of these materials, uh, but that, that's, a, that's been a big splash. Okay. And yes, this is the paper about how you find these things, and they, they release all the 400,000 new compounds, but they don't release the machine learning algorithm that they use to find them. Uh, and of course, their advertising is good. The first I heard that they've written this up, I read it in The Economist, right? Now that's good PR if, uh, you, if, you're, if your paper first appears in The Economist. Uh, okay. Now, about six months ago, have we heard about this thing? Mace? Georg, have you heard about Mace? <laughs> uh, we, we should discuss this, right? This is Mace MP0, right? And you see... Uh, just like Uli's picture, right? It's doing all these different things, right? So this is, a, they're calling it a foundational model for uh, atomistic chemistry. So they're making uh, machine learned potential, but yeah, this was based on other people's ideas. They train on all the, all the inorganic compounds in the materials genome project. You take all of them, you melt them a bit, in a DFT calculation so that the atoms wiggle and stuff, and you use this to train your machine learning potential. Now, what's cool about this is, so you're going over the entire, actually, I think they went up to Z equal to 92, uh, almost the entire periodic table. So that's, you're, you're sort of searching chemical compound space at the same time as you're also searching materials, configuration space. So you want potentials that work for all these things simultaneously. And then, you know, the several hundred people or whatever who are on the, the this, uh, or the authors, uh, they're just testing this whole thing, right? Uh, in all sorts of different contexts. Now, it doesn't give you even the accuracy of the DFT that it was trained on. In general, it's lower accuracy. But what's interesting is it doesn't blow up. And you apply it to many, many different situations, and especially surface things where, or interfaces of liquids or, or solids, and all those kinds of messy things, not necessarily pure materials calculations. Uh, it doesn't blow up. It gives you reasonable answers so you can run the MD, collect statistics, et cetera, et cetera. And then if you found the things you want to look at, you can do delta learning. And with a few DFT calculations, you can refine the general model to something more precise that has essentially DFT accuracy. Or so they say. I wouldn't know. Oh, this, yeah, this is the kitchen sink, you know, which, you know, it includes everything, as including the kitchen sink. Okay. Okay. Something completely different. Uh, so this is something I just wanted to mention to you guys. It's sort of on the horizon, but uh, it isn't there yet. So there's a, there's a thing called classical density functional theory. You don't apply it to the electron. 
you apply it to say your water molecules to your constituents in a fluid um, and it's a theorem that you can deduce from uh, well it's actually really the classical limit of the merman theorem uh, it applies to classical fluids at equilibrium and if you know the functional in, for these classical fluids you can avoid having to do the md simulation you can get equilibrium properties out by just solving a single equation for the equilibrium density uh, and it was proven about 40 years ago almost uh, 35 years ago by a friend of mine bob evans okay so this can be this can be this is insanely useful right uh you can use it to do everything you so you go past having to do an md uh and you can reach all sorts of uh time and size scales and you can watch nucleation with a sort of time dependent version of it and so it's very possibly very powerful in electrochemistry but it's only a dream because every liquid has its own uh forces uh so that means each uh, its own internal forces which means each one has a different functional so the whole field uh you have to find that functional for every one and essentially uh no one has uh gone beyond simple uh, toy models uh in a few cases you can sort of calculate this functional but otherwise not until uh this paper appeared let me see uh a year or so ago where people really did a serious job of doing a neural network uh to find this functional so what you do is you uh, do an md simulation do a bunch of MD simulations on inhomogeneous uh, liquids. You learn on them, and from that you calculate a, a numerically a functional for your liquid, and then you can apply it to all sorts of situations uh, for that fluid. And just three weeks ago, uh, Schmidt's group uh, teamed up with Bob Evans, and they've been able to show very, very surprisingly that, for example, you can train. Uh, in the liquid phase and to, uh, train a functional and then use it, let's say in the gas phase, and it's still active. They were very surprised that they could go through a phase boundary. They even find uh, if, if they try to pull out the exponents of the, the critical exponents of the phase transition, they seem to be different from mean field exponents. And they don't even understand how it can be doing that, but it seems to be doing that. Uh, they're very cautious about how they put things. And this this was put on the archive uh, August 28th, uh, so last month. So I made this little PowerPoint thing, right? Uh, bridging these scales, right? So this could be couple cluster, it could be quantum Monte Carlo, some highly accurate quantum solver, more accurate than DFT. Maybe even do 10 atoms, 20 atoms in a molecule. Uh, after that, it starts getting too expensive. DFT, maybe you do a thousand. MD, maybe you do a million. But if you can go from there to classical DFT, uh, sort of, there is no limit. Uh, so you could imagine, by training on this data with machine learning, you get an exchange correlation uh, that works for that. You can, we're going to hear in a few minutes, right, Georg? Finish the talk. You're running out of time. Uh, machine learning potential gets you from DFT to you put it into your MD, just like that MACE stuff. Uh, and then now we're seeing maybe you can get classical uh, machine learning functionals do classical DFT and this really does get you to macroscopic scales right now you know early days all they're doing are Leonard Jones potentials because that's they know the most about those cases so we'll see what happens and there's a picture I like to show from Sandia National Labs uh, showing uh, a, this carbon shock simulation 
So uh, it's been shocked. The carbon has been shocked here. It's unshocked, and you're watching. This is a, a photo of the shock wave passing through the crystal. What's nice about this, it was done by my friend, Adrian Thompson, with lamps, 18 billion carbon atoms, right? I don't think anyone's going to be running a DFT simulation uh, with 18 billion atoms anytime soon, but it's a machine learned potential uh, where they could run it with 18 billion. Okay, practical items. So these are little things about machine learning, right? I think everybody going to college should be taught how to use a Python notebook in the first week. And all the old professors teaching them should learn how to teach with these notebooks. This changes totally what's uh, possible. Uh, every, every student who is currently in get, getting a PhD should get some exposure to machine learning, whether in their research or in a course. It's really helpful for your future earnings. Uh, I mentioned this already. So whether we love it or hate it, it's important that we learn about it. Uh, in humanities, they've all read, they're ahead of the scientists in many ways. They, they have embraced chat GPT, at least in our place. Uh, so, so people ask me, is this a paradigm shift? And that term, was originated right by Thomas Kuhn. Uh, was he Austrian too? Oh, okay. Are we okay? Uh, so uh, to talk about you know quantum mechanics, right? Back to those guys I was showing you. Planck identifies the Planck constant in 1900. The Schrödinger equation is 1926. So you can have an entire scientific career learning about quantum mechanics without having the Schrodinger equation, right? They were sort of uh, fussing around in the dark. Uh, so paradigm shifts don't happen overnight, right? People seem to think that's what it means. It, it doesn't, it's, it's changed. And I think that is what's going on. Scales, important scales. The NSF annual budget is about 9 billion at the moment. The NIH uh, budget, National Institute of Health is 47 billion. All us physical sciences would rather have NIH grants. But uh, OpenAI, uh, 86 billion, right? The ones who gave you chat GPT. And actually it's gone up uh, uh, since February. This is what happened to the students. Uh, work I've been mentioning, Lee Lee, he likes to say, he used to work for the good of humanity and now he doesn't. Uh, he, 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 he tries to waste humanity's time. Uh, uh, Bupali Kalita, who then did a paper on sort of weakly correlated systems, now makes force fields uh, at Carnegie Mellon. Ryan, who was very, very good uh, a startup in bio and pharmaceutical discoveries. And then Johnny, we didn't really go into his work, uh, ended up as a patent agent. Uh, yeah. So uh, will, will machine learning get us a better uh, exchange correlation? And a way to, to think about this, you can just go back into the past and ask what would have happened if they'd had the formulas that we got in the 90s? Uh, and you can very clearly see that it would have accelerated a lot uh, of science. Uh, so I think, yes, machine learning will get us a better exchange correlation energy. So what happened to those deep mind guys? They did their DM21. It was a bit of a flub. Uh, they got merged with Google Brain about six months ago. And now my friend Josh now works for them in London. And I talked with, well, I did more than talk with them a few weeks ago. Uh, I started consulting for them two months ago. But I can't tell you what we're doing because I signed a non-disclosure agreement. Welcome to the new world. Uh, uh, but as I like to say to people, if you guessed what it was they were interested in, you'd be right. <laughs> okay, this, I just got to finish up now. Uh, next hundred years. So, so I also do stuff in warm, dense matter. And I mentioned it last fr on Friday. 
So these are exoplanets, right? And we used to have just a few, and now we have at least 5,000. And there's only going to be one time, as I like to put it to those guys, in the history of humanity, where we don't understand how the interiors of these planets work. And then we do. You know, we do flyby from the big planets uh, in our solar system, and we keep getting more, like, really great detailed information on these exoplanets, which keep going forward in leaps and bounds. And then we will figure this out. You're running DFT calculations and machine learning potentially. So it is so cool to be part of that, right? Uh, to be doing that, where, and, you know, it's such a fascinating intellectual adventure where, you know, you no idea if, if anyone will ever be able to test anything, right? Okay, to summarize. So I think I've given you some sense of the importance of machine learning. And we'll hear some real applications very soon. Watch out for the rise of bad or fraudulent papers, not Georg's, but other people's. Uh, uh, and the, the impact, right? So what we're seeing is machine learning potentials are allowing people to do all sorts of things that they couldn't do before. Uh, and yeah, so I like to say that. And thanks for the invite. Thanks for your attention.